I usually, uh, we have like a cue that tells me that the offering is over up on the screen usually uh, so that people don't think I'm turning around making sure you give. Man, we had a fantastic week this week at Vacation Bible School, guys, and uh, we appreciate you parents for uh, bringing your kiddos, sharing them with us this week. Uh, it, it's been an amazing time, and of course, we had a lot of fun. We, we danced, we sang, we did crafts, we, we studied the Bible and so forth, but ultimately, we had the opportunity to share the gospel with, uh, with these kiddos, and many, many had already made public professions of faith. Uh, prior to this, but we had we had two kiddos who uh, who made public professions of faith. In other words, they confessed faith in Jesus Christ. And uh, let me tell you, guys, that that is what it's all about, right there. That's what it's all about. Uh, raise your hand if you have heard ever heard of Nacho Mama. Anybody heard of Nacho Mama? Okay, this is Nacho Mama's sermon today. All right, we're just going to go over what we talked about all week. And uh, I want to begin by just asking a question. It's a rhetorical question. You don't have to answer that. It's a rhetorical question. But, but who, is, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? You ask that question all over the world and around. And Jesus even asked that question to his disciples. And he said, you know, who, who do people say that I am? And they say, oh, they, some say you're this, some say you're that. And, and, and Peter, he turns to Peter, who do you say? I am, and he, and he says, you are the Christ. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Messiah. You're the, you're, the, you're the Savior. Jesus said, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but my Father in heaven. You may know that there are actually 256 different names in the Bible that refer to Jesus. That's a lot. That's a lot, because you see, Jesus is God. And so he is infinite. He's infinite. He is the God man. The Holy Spirit came upon Mary, impregnated Mary miraculously. There was no father. And he was born of a virgin. And he lived a perfect life. Never sinned, not even once. Never violated any, any of, of God's laws in practice and in thought. Never sinned, not even once. And he shed his blood voluntarily as a satisfaction of God's wrath, against, uh, God's anger, God's godly anger against sin. Satisfied every bit of it for all sin, for all time. And, and atoned for, for the sins of the believer. Rose from the dead to prove who he is. He is a God man. He is 100% undiminished deity and 100% perfect humanity. He had to be God to be perfect because God required a perfect sacrifice, a sinless, flawless sacrifice. He had to be God to be perfect. He had to be human so he could die. Over in Hebrews, it says, without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sin. And we, as we read through the Old Testament, you see, read all of the things about the sacrificial system and the requirements of, of the shedding of blood for, for the animals and so forth uh, when, when people break the, the laws and so forth. That was a, a model, a model of, of what is necessary in order to satisfy God's anger, God's godly anger against sin. And Jesus paid that price in full. It's paid in full. Rose from the dead to prove who he is. Ascended into heaven. And, and many of you remember that I say, seated at the right hand of power. You know, when you, when you read it in the, in the Bible, it says seated at the right hand of God. I say seated at the right hand of power because when you go back to the original language to, to understand what that is, it means ultimate, ultimate sovereignty, ultimate power. And so I say seated at the right hand of power because the right hand signifies power and control and sovereignty. See, the right hand of power means he is large, he is God, and in charge, he is Lord. That is who Jesus is. So for, on day one, we started talking about uh, some qualities of Jesus, of the God man. The first one is that Jesus is holy. You know, you're trying to, try to explain to, to, to kiddos holiness. And so I have, I have an example. Maybe you've seen this before uh, that, I, that I set over here. 
But what I have are, are two, two glasses of water. These are, they're, they're, these are two glasses of water. There's a little bit difference in, in these glasses, though, aren't there, kids? Right? There, there's other stuff in this glass, right? In this glass, it, you can see all the way through. I, I look there. I, well, you guys look a little bigger when I look through that, that way. But both of these have water in them. But see, there are impurities in this glass, whereas there are no impurities in this glass. It's actually 400 feet water from our, in our new well. So I'm telling you, it's pure water. I could, I could drink it. I don't know. It's been sitting out, though, so I don't know. But, but, but you see, holy means devoid or, or lacking. I won't say devoid. That's too big a word for you kids, right? Look it up. Lacking any kind of impurity. It's pure. It's absolutely pure. And Jesus is absolutely pure. He's absolutely holy. He's absolutely perfect. And the beautiful thing is that that, for believers, is what he did for us. He made us. He, he took all of our impurities out of us. This is, this is us before that we became believers in salvation by faith in Christ. And this is us after. That's before, before and after. He, he cleansed us from all of our unrighteousness and made us pure. He set us apart for a pure purpose, a holy purpose. Jesus is holy. On day two, we talked about Jesus being trustworthy. Jesus is trustworthy. And I want to I give you an example of that. Many of you know that, uh, that before the Lord called me to, uh, to, to the pastorate, I, I led sales organizations. And we did a lot of like team building exercises and so forth. And one of the team building exercises, if I could uh, get Pastor Stephen to indulge me here uh, on this, was, uh, was what's called a trust fall. And if you get with your if you get with your coworkers, if you if you can get your coworker to do a trust fall with you, though you know they trust you, right? You know you get some people that they'll start to do the trust fall, and the person will like walk way all the way over here, and the guy's got his back there, right? But uh, but but to do a trust fall, I'm just going to turn around and close my eyes, and I'm going to fall back, and I know that Pastor Stephen is going to catch me, see? Because I trust him. Because I trust him. Right? Right? Jesus is trustworthy. He is trustworthy. And so when, when someone is trustworthy, you know that if they tell you something, you can count on it. You can count on it. God is trustworthy. Jesus is God. He is trustworthy. That means that when he says something, you can believe it. To know that you know that you know that you know that he's going to do it. And there are many promises in the word of God, friends, many promises. And if the word of God gives you a promise, friends, do you believe that it's going to come to pass? I do. I do because our God is faithful. So faithfulness is to always do what you say you will do and to never do what you say you will not do. Faithfulness. Faithfulness. You know, that's a transferable quality of God. But Jesus is trustworthy. And you know what he said? He said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father, God the Father, except by me, by Jesus Christ. Because you see, friends, he bridged the gap between flawed humanity and perfect God. And he is trustworthy. And when he says he will do something, he does it. When he says he will save, he does. To all who believe, Jesus is trustworthy. On day three, we talked about the fact that Jesus is forgiving. And you know, there are many, many <coughs> lack, uh, really a lack of understanding of, of what forgiveness really is. You know, and and. You know, some people, they'll, they'll, they'll have issues with folks in their life. Maybe, maybe you know somebody who has issues where somebody did somebody dirt, right? They did, did somebody wrong, you know, and, and they, get, they get so messed up in their mind that they even go sometimes to therapy. And the therapist will say, well, all you need to forgive them. 
you need to forgive them. And, you know, and so there, there's this false sense of, of forgiveness where like they work up in their mind and they say, well, I forgive them. But you know what? They, they really they really didn't. And it's still and, and there's that gunny sack of stuff that they're just dragging around with them and, and, and just holding what we call grudges against other folks that that, that, that did, did them dirty. Jesus is forgiving. There, there's a story. And I don't know if it's a true story or where it's made up, but it's a great story. So I'm going to share it with you uh, about this, uh, this, this, this priest in, in the Philippines. And this priest in the Philippines had heard there was a lady who claimed that she talked to Jesus. You ever heard anyone claim they talked to God? You ever had anybody come to you and say, God told me. God came to me and told me that you should marry him. You ever, you ever heard anyone do that? You know, and it cracks me up. Pastor Steve and I talked about this, you know, many, many years ago. Nobody in this room would come to Pastor Stephen and say, you know, Pastor Stephen, God told me that you need to sing more hymns. So Pastor Stephen said, could you tell him to tell me, please? <laughs> Over in Hebrews, in chapter one of Hebrews, it says long ago in many times in many ways. God spoke to us through the prophets, but now he speaks to us through his son. And that's metaphorical. You know, some people take that literally and say, oh, well, he speaks to me. You know, he's, God, the son speaks to me. Well, it, it's metaphorical in, in the sense of, the, uh, of that the message of the gospel is, is what speaks to us now. You see, But there's this lady that took that literally that was in the Philippines. And this priest kind of knew that. And he was like, yeah, OK, well. Turns out that back when he was in seminary, he had committed an egregious sin. Because you can look that up later. It just means something very despicable and very awful that he had never told anyone about. He had committed this sin and he carried it around with him. He says, well, now this is a good opportunity for me to really see if this lady speaks to Jesus. So he went to the lady and he said, can you, next time you talk to Jesus, ask him, what was, what was the egregious sin that I, the priest, committed when I was in seminary? She said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to him. Well, he saw her several weeks later. He's like, hey, did you, ever, did you ever talk to Jesus about me? She said, yes, I did. He said, well, did you ask him about the sin? She said, yes, I did. He said, what did, she, what did he say? She said, he said he doesn't remember. Because you see, friends, Jesus forgives and forgets. There is nothing in the ledger. There is nothing that he's holding against you. All of the, all of the egregious things that we have done in our life, all of us, for all of us, have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We read that over in Romans as we're going through Romans this year. We're drifting into next year now. With Romans, but we're, we're taking it apart verse by verse. Romans 3.23 says, for all the sin and fall short of the glory of God. In other words, in our, own, in our own works, in our own abilities, we have failed. But you see, the beautiful thing is that Jesus forgives. But he just doesn't only forgive, he forgets. There's nothing in the ledger. There's nothing he's holding against you. There's no gunny sack that Jesus is carrying around against you. Hallelujah. On day four, we understood and learned that Jesus is worth following. And maybe you, maybe you played this game when you were a kid, you know, follow the leader, you know. And, and so there, there's a person at the front of the line, and they walk. And as they take turns, you're supposed to turn with them and so forth. And uh, we actually didn't play that game this week. But there was another game that that's, that's a better, better under, gives us a better understanding about what following Jesus means. Following Jesus does not mean just, just walking behind him literally and going. No. What it means, we played a game called Simon Says. Simon Says, stand up. Simon Says, sit down. Yeah, we're not playing Simon Says. I'm just giving you that, that illustration. Okay, just saying. So, you know, Simon Says, stand up. Simon Says, sit down. Simon Says, lift your right arm. Simon Says, lift your left. All of that. So you see, following Jesus means... Doing what he says to do and not doing what he says not to do. See, being a follower of Jesus is different than being a fan of Jesus. 
Years ago, I read a book. I can't even remember the author's name, but it's a great book. Not a fan, it's, it's called. And it talks about the difference between being a follower and being a fan. Many of us are sports enthusiasts. Maybe you even have season tickets to some of uh, the, either the football games or the baseball games or our great teams here in, in Houston. I'm, I'm sure that, that we'd rather them be doing a little bit better right now than, than they're doing, but that's okay. We're still a fan, right? You're a fan. So if you're a fan, and you know, either you're watching them on the, on the big screen of the TV at your house, or you buy some tickets and you go there and spend $127 on hot dogs and popcorn and all of that, and you're a fan, but you're sitting there in, in the stands watching the game. The players are down there on the field, sweating, working, training for hours upon hours and end to, to, to perform in the game at their highest, best level. But as a fan, you just get, there, get to sit there and watch. That's a fan. The follower is down there on the field. The follower is the one that's, that, that's going to spring training, shagging pop flies, fielding grounders, batting practice, watching videos, making sure the muscle memory is there so that when you swing that bat, it's a home run swing. Follower of Jesus understands the sacrifice that, that it takes to be what he's called us to be. Because you see, he fronted, you know, it's, it, it's like if you got hired in a new job and, and, and they, they said, you know, um, we, you are absolutely perfect for our company. You're absolutely the perfect person for this role in our company. And so we're going to go ahead and front you your pay for the next 50 years. <laughs> Woohoo, right? How many of us would be diligent to show up for work every day? But see, you've been fronted. You've been fronted. You're, you're, you're paying for the new heaven and the new earth. But you see, you and I, lovers, lovers of God, lovers of, of Jesus Christ, are not doing things out of obligation like maybe we, we do at work. We do things out of love. Because of who and who and whose we are, see. Because you see, when you when you step through with the other side of that veil, when you step through that that understand to that understanding of salvation by faith in Christ, you are a new creation in Christ. Yes, Ephesians chapter two verses eight and nine says we're saved by grace through faith, and this grace through faith is not of yourself; it's a gift of God, and not by works. So that no one should boast, right? And once saved, always saved. I know there are some folks that believe you can lose your salvation. I don't think the Bible teaches that. But we skip over a lot of times recognizing verse 10, which says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we would walk in them. It's all in the package of grace and faith that we are automatically going to do these things. As a follower of Jesus Christ. It's all in, it's all in the package of grace. Given to us in, in, in advance. It's still still a, a, a choice that we make to do. Because you know that flawed flesh. And those, those of you who worship here with, with us every week. You remember that picture of those two silhouettes. The sarks that's around. The old nature and the new nature. The, the sarks that's right. It wants to pull us away. It wants to pull us from doing what God's called us to do with that lane correction technology that the Holy Spirit says wrong and it points us in the direction keeps us on the straight and narrow path to keep the main thing the main thing to live a life worthy of calling that has been placed on us follower Jesus is worth following day five day five is my always, always my favorite Jesus is for everyone who believes well wait a second over in the book of James, the, the Bible says even the demons believe and they shudder. But they won't spend eternity in the new heaven and the new earth. They won't. Why? Because they recognize who he is, but he's not their savior. So everyone who believes, what, what does it mean to believe? I'm glad you asked. Well, we talked about this to our, to, to our kiddos. Kids, we, we, we talked about the ABCs of, of salvation in the first 
the A, and you heard the song, you know, admit you're a sinner. In other words, we have to recognize that we have fallen short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Admit you're a sinner. Admit you've done things that are hurting Jesus' heart or have not done things that are pleasing in his sight. Either way, it's, it's either omission or, or commission. Admit you're a sinner. Admit that you are, are short of the expectations, the perfect, perfect calling of God. And, you know, we have to be perfect. Not just, not just good, but perfect. See, because heaven's a perfect place. And if we're not perfect and we enter heaven, it will no longer be perfect. Right? So we have to be perfected. So we have to recognize that we're not perfect. And then we have to recognize that we need to be perfected. And then we have to recognize, be, believe that Jesus Christ is the author and perfecter of our faith. He's the author and perfecter of our faith. In other words, he makes us pure, makes us holy. We are tainted, but then Jesus steps in and his actions on earth and on the cross have made us pure in the sight of God. And when we stand before the Bema Seat as believers, we will stand before the Bema Seat and Jesus will stand in front of us and all God the Father will see in judgment is the perfection of Jesus. And he will say, perfect. We have to believe that Jesus is the God-man. We have to believe that he was born of the Virgin Mary, that the Holy Spirit came upon her miraculously, lived a perfect life, Never sinned, not even once. Shed his blood voluntarily as a satisfaction of God's wrath, his anger against sin. And atoned for my sin, made up for all of my sin. Rose from the dead to prove who he is. He's God. He's the God man. 100% undiminished deity. 100% perfect humanity. Ascended into heaven. Seated at the right hand of power because he is Large and in charge. He is God and he is Lord. Takes me to see. Confess that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. Lord and Savior. Over in chapter 10, we haven't gotten to chapter 10 in Romans yet, but the text says there in chapter 10 that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised from the dead, believe in your heart, that's metaphorical for knowing that, knowing that you know, that you know, that you know. Like you know your own name, you will be saved. That is evidence, friends. If, if you believe that, if you confess that Jesus is Lord, that, that Greek word kurios means recognizing that he is over you. That you are arranging yourself under him as your dictator. He's a ben Jesus is a dictator, but he's a benevolent dictator. And we're arranging ourselves under that. See, that's, that's what the demons never would do. And that's, a, that's why they will spend eternity in the lake of fire. And make your sinner believe that Jesus is that redeemer. Confess that he is your Lord. And that is evidence that you are a new creation in Christ. This is what we shared with your kiddos this week in a very clear way. In a very simple way. And I wanted to share with all of you today the things that we talked about, about who Jesus is. And I thank you all for sharing your kiddos with us this week. It's been a very fabulous week. We've thoroughly enjoyed it. All the folks just slept right on from sat from Friday night all the way to this morning. But we're rested and, and relaxed and ready to rock and roll for Jesus Christ this coming week. And I hope you have a good week. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come together as the body of Christ like this this morning. Praising you, worshiping you, glorifying you. And Lord, I just pray that as we go out from this place, Lord... <coughs> That we would be Jesus with skin on. That we would be living out a contagious faith. That we would be living out a life that others can see Jesus in us. And that they would also come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. And I praise you and I thank you for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. And as we close out the service, let's stand and sing. Um, Many of you will know this song if you went to VBS this week. If you didn't, then uh, hopefully you caught on a little bit to this. But we just want to sing this song as we head out.